Wonderful to see you all here this evening. My name is Eileen Regan and I'm with the Research and Information Service here in the Assembly. Um, we're delighted to have the Assembly Speaker Robin Newton join us and host this evening's launch of the sixth annual program of the Knowledge Exchange Seminar Series. Well, good evening and, and, and welcome. And it, it gives me a great pleasure to, to welcome you here to host the launch of this sixth annual program for KESS, the Knowledge Exchange Seminar Series. And this launch provides an excellent opportunity to show my support and to showcase this exact successful partnership, a successful partnership between the Assembly and the three universities located in Northern Ireland, Queen's University of Belfast, Ulster University, and not forgetting the Open University, who they remind me are sandwiched between the other two up on the, 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 the pop-up folder here. I do want to put on record the fact that KESS is now recognised far beyond the Northern Ireland Assembly. At annual conferences of the Interparliamentary Research Information Network in 2014 and again in 2016, KESS was featured as a unique model to provide the promotion of evidence-led policy and evidence-led lawmaking. I wish you all every success with this year's programme and now we'd like to introduce you to Jane Tinkler. Jane recently became the Senior Prize Manager for the Nine Dots Prize, a major new, new initiative for the social sciences which aims to stimulate research into vital but under-examined questions of relevance in today's world. This new endeavour follows the conclusion of her secondment as a senior advisor uh, in the social sciences in the UK Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology with the acronym POST. Jane has been a social science researcher for nearly 10 years, working on applied projects with government, civil society and academic partners. And prior to joining POST, she was based at the public policy group of the London School of Economics. And Jane and I had a discussion about the London School of Economics, later in my ambitions at one time to be part of that. But amongst other things, she examined the impact of academic research in social sciences and co-authored the book entitled The Impact of the Social Sciences, How Academics and Their Work Makes a Difference. Tonight, Jane will draw on her diverse range of knowledge and experience, sharing her insights to achieving, achieving impact through partnerships working, work involving academics, policymakers, and legislators. Jane, we look forward to hearing what you have to say, and can I ask you all to, in the usual manner, thank Jane as she comes to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and for coming along to, um, to this uh, launch today. Um, uh, I'm delighted to be able to talk a bit about uh, the impact of beneficial academic and policy and law making partnerships. It's something I feel very passionately about and um, I'm always quite happy to talk about it. Uh, if you knew me, you'd know that was quite an understatement. But anyway, um, it's also really nice to be uh, at the launch of such a well-established activity that has building these links um, as its core objective. So the aims of the seminar series are to develop understanding and awareness, as well as encourage um, debate and engagement between and all, all those who attend. The seminar series, as you've heard, is now in its sixth year, and with attendances increasing each year, I think you can see how valuable people are finding it. So for some of what I'm going to say, I think, I hope, that I might be preaching to the converted uh, in this room. Um, but it's always useful to look at um, why you're doing impact kind of activities in the first place and reconfirm your commitment to them. It takes time, skills and resources to try and create impact, to try and build partnerships. So you need to be sure why you're doing the things that you are doing. So I'm going to be briefly talking about some findings from research that colleagues and I at the London School of Economics did on how academic research, especially in the social sciences, has impact and the type of impacts that it has. 
We called the project The Impact of the Social Sciences, and we have, as you might expect, and you've just heard, we wrote a book about it. Um, but we also uh, created an academic blog uh, called the LSE Impact Blog as our way of trying to put some um, of our learning about how um, you can use social media to build relationships to affect. Um, so let's start by thinking about how impact happens. When we started research on this, we found that generally the models of impact seemed very linear. They seemed more suited to work in the sciences, where, for example, a drug is created, people take that drug, they get better, and therefore there's a benefit at the end of it. We know from um, um, our work that impact um, from research in humanities and social sciences just really doesn't happen in that way. It's much more cumulative and incremental. We also know that academics are not the only actors in society who produce and mediate research. There's a huge amount done by individuals and organisations in government, in business, in the third sector and in the media to create research. And work is constantly picked up by these actors, used, improved, modified and churned back into what we saw as being an existing stock or inventory of knowledge. So this stock or inventory of knowledge um, includes knowledge that's in use, but also knowledge that is not currently being in use. And I imagine this as sort of forgotten knowledge sitting on dusty shelves in university libraries. Knowledge also comes in different um, types. There's ordinary knowledge, the type that is experienced, that we learn by doing. There's applied knowledge and research, the type that I tend to do, often working with partners to co-create and co-produce applied research. And then there's very theoretical and abstract knowledge that tends to look beyond immediate problems and immediate solutions. So what we're trying to do when we're um, seeking to create impact is three things. We're trying to increase the churn of knowledge in this um, inventory so that more of the quality research is recognised and used. But we also want to help reduce the time it takes for research to be produced in universities or other places um, and for it to get out to be used, to be publicly accessible by those who it might be useful for. And finally, we want to take more of that theoretical and abstract knowledge and take, move it across so that it's able to be applied to real-world um, situations where it can have impact. Now, there are a number of ways that this can happen, but there are also some real barriers um, that make this process more difficult. So one of the questions we asked ourselves in the research is what stops more research being used by policy and lawmakers? We did about 150 interviews as part of our research and we asked both academics and policymakers this question and they gave us two key responses. The first one, people held up their hands and said, we're just too different academics and policymakers. We speak different languages, we have different goals, we focus on different time horizons, and we look at problems from different perspectives. The second key response was, we are just working to two different deadlines. Um, a quote from a senior government official was, the biggest difference is that policy has to be decided in the here and now, and we have to do it on the basis of whatever evidence there is available. Whereas some academics can take 20, 20 years to produce a piece of work, um, they just have much longer in terms of deadlines to be able to complete something. We also often don't have the same idea of what evidence is. In the slide pack, there's a slightly tongue-in-cheek typology um, of evidence as policymakers see it from the former Deputy Chief Social Researcher, Phil Davies. He lists expert evidence at number one at the top of the list, but by that he means consultants and think tanks, not academic uh, evidence. 
You then work down the list and you get media and internet evidence in the middle of the list. And research, academic evidence, is right at the bottom, just below the thoughts of cab drivers. But our research showed that the importance and value placed on creating excellent, accessible research by academics was just as high as the importance and value placed on using excellent, accessible research by policymakers and lawmakers. And the pressures and difficulties that both sides found are similar. Um, there's a lack of time and resources to build links. There's inflexibility within your own or the partner organisation to be able to grow partnerships. And a lack of awareness about the benefits of spending time on building these partnerships. So not really being able to show the impact of all this time and resource that you're putting in. Now these barriers are real, but am I downhearted? No, I am not. And I'm going to outline, uh, as you might expect, three reasons to be cheerful about the use of evidence uh, by policy and lawmakers. So number one, there's a greater demand, it feels to me, for evidence from policymakers. Um, and I think um, austerity has actually um, had a, a good and bad effect here. So austerity has meant that there's a lot less funding for research out there. We've especially seen that in the funding that, for example, um, the government departments in, in Westminster are um, commissioning from academics. But that has meant that there's an increased demand and incentives to make best use of the research that there is out there. And I think the What Works Network shows this commitment from government and academic communities to the systematic use of evidence across the public sector and making better use of the research that's available. So reason to be cheerful number two is that there's a better supply of more accessible research from academics. Partly I think this is down to the Research Excellent Framework, the REF, providing incentives for those academics who have been actively engaging with practitioners but have not up to this point had any rewards for doing so. So from the results of the first REF, we can see how important the link between academic and policymakers are. Informing government policy was the singest largest group of um, impacts, um, and that was mentioned in over 3,000 of the 7,000 impact case studies that were submitted for REF 2014. And that was across all of the um, big subject disciplines, so science, social science, arts, and humanities. Um, the REF also showed us the richness and diversity of academic work and the many ways that academics connect out into the world of government, business and civil society. The REF also means there's more support and funding for mainstreaming impact, impact activities and support in universities for building links with policymaking bodies. It feels that there has been a culture change in universities that recognises practitioner engagement and public engagement more widely as a core part of the academic process. And I've seen a lot of universities starting with PhD students and early career researchers. So there's a generation of researchers coming through who see this as just part of what they do and are being helped to get the skills that they need to be able to do that effectively. And one point that I'm always asked about by academics is whether it's possible to do both of these things, to produce excellent research that gets you benefits within academia in terms of progression, but also to un undertake impact activities to go out and engage with practitioner communities. Our research found that it was possible to do both of these things, and we talked to academics who were doing that and they outlined how important, how valuable each of those things was for the other. So partnerships with practitioner organisations led to better quality research. And that excellent research then led to more opportunities to partner with um, policymakers or other external organisations. And my third reason to be cheerful 
is around the new tools that are lowering transaction costs for bridge building, for building partnerships. We've seen how digital and social media are changing how act academics and practitioners communicate with each other uh, and within their own groups. So the growth of academic blogging or the use of Twitter as a communication channel. So discussions around policy are often taking place in online spaces that are owned neither by universities or by government or parliament. They're being hosted by other bodies in a digital space and academics and policymakers can, can contribute to them. And the increase in the number of academic publications that are open access mean more long-form academic research is becoming accessible to those who might use them across all sectors. And this leads to a reduction in the siloing of knowledge. In policy making, all problems require joined up solutions. So for effective engagement, relationships are key. And our research found the most difficult stage for building partnerships between academic and policy and lawmakers is that building relationships bit. There's often lots of opportunities for initial meetings, for um, getting together with people who might be interested in your particular policy area. But the real difficulties come when you try and build those relationships and make them long lasting. And just a note here that actually those relationships don't necessarily need to be directly between academics and policymakers. Research, advances and insights can be communicated and transferred to a wide range of individuals and organisations and their lessons mediated, deliberated and drawn out in usable ways. And some of that work is done by those others than academics and policymakers themselves. There's an important role for translating or mediating bodies who link research with those who might be able to use it. And these types of organisations I'm talking about include think tanks, policy institutes, journalists in the media, libraries, societies and association and interest groups. And in our research we called this the mediating middle and we showed quite how important they were. Our research also found that there's a significantly bigger mediating middle for the sciences um, doing that essential work of translating for outside audiences than in the social sciences. So we often talk to social science academics about the fact that they have to do some of that translating work themselves. So initiatives like the KESS programme are key as they help build relationships between academics, policymakers and lawmakers. And its longevity is important so relationships can build and develop over time. The seminars allow informal advice and discussions to take place outside of what may be quite formal relationships otherwise. The seminars help to get round some of the problems that I mentioned above. For example, for an individual academic, it's hard to know where to start, where to direct your initial contact in a large government body. And because officials move so frequently, you may have just been able to start developing a relationship, they move jobs and you're back to square one. And for policymakers, how do you find out what ac academic research is going on that might be useful for you in your policy area? How do you access networks that might help you understand an area more effectively? And how can you get academics to write in a way that is accessible and useful for the questions you need to answer? By regularly engaging in these kind of seminar sessions, attendees will hopefully find answers to some of these questions. So I wanted to end with a couple of quotes that I think are um, points to think about for both academics and policymakers. One academic that we interviewed as part of our research said that for her, the key thing was, the question is, are we ready as researchers to give sound advice when an opportunity comes up? Are we good at deploying what we know? 
And a policymaker said, it can seem like it, come, it can come down to one meeting or one piece of research. It has to be more intrinsic so that all decisions are based on a sort of soaking up of good quality research over time. So, best of luck with your seminar series this year, and thank you again for inviting me. It looks to be a fascinating uh, set of uh, seminars, and yeah, uh, I, I wish you all the best with it. <laughs>